this is the fourth module of Traffic Safety Academy. As Ryan says, uh, we're working towards being able to identify and solve problems on the roadway. Uh, we are right now in the understand how to find and use the data uh, portion of it. Um, after we'll have one more on uh, module five will be on crash data. And then starting with module six, we'll start getting into the actual emphasis areas and start breaking those down. Uh, we can see that here. So Thursday, um, we're going to be getting into intersection safety. <laughs> so what are we going to cover today? We're going to talk a little bit about how we think about solving safety issues, how we select countermeasures, and how do we get past countermeasures in solving or preventing problems using design. Um, so in the beginning, we're going to talk a little bit about, like, and these, these aren't hard and fast rules. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, mindset and what we're trying to accomplish with countermeasures. Ryan hit on it a good bit with safe systems. So this is more of um, before we get into that safe systems, what are we doing? Uh, and then getting into finding the actual countermeasures um, in a manner that tells us how effective that they're going to be without having to sort through a lot of, of research. Uh, so just to, to get us kicked off on the right foot, uh, getting to the idea of rethinking design, that's a Swedish cartoon, um, you know, we kind of look at this as being holistic um, where we have different places where it's appropriate, uh, you know, sidewalk, crosswalks, but really when we get into the places where it's appropriate to stand, um, it just trying to make a kind of a dramatic point of our facilities aren't quite what we think we are when we look at it a little bit differently. So how do we solve and prevent safety issues? We are good at the physics of driving, right? Um, so whether it's the friction of our asphalt, whether it is figuring out the super elevation of a curve based on the asphalt friction, co the coefficient of friction, the speeds and the horizontal curvature, right? Um, <clears throat> we're good at figuring out what cross slope needs to be to get water to sheet flow off the roadway. Uh, and that's the easy part of design and engineering, right? Like the, the numbers part is the easy part of our job. But but how do we get into the people part? Because that's that's the harder, the, the more difficult part, right? Um, as I said before, other um, other professions, other engineering professions do get into the people part. They, they figure out how people think. Um, Amazon, if you want to get into marketing, has really figured out how to engineer around the human experience. Um, Disney versus Universal, uh, you know, so we're up, we're, we live in Florida. Um, if you go to Disney versus going to Universal, Busch Gardens, some of the theme park, um, there's always a difference in Disney. Um, how you wait in lines, how you, they move people, uh, they're very good at that science. You can notice the difference. And when you can notice the difference, then that means that we know that there is a formula, there is a way to make it happen. Um, OSHA does it, industrial engineering does it, uh, architecture does it. So, So how do we do it, right? Um, so going back in time to the idea of limiting exposures, wanting to separate users in time and space. And we start seeing that in our day to day design standards. Um, we look at a keyhole, right? The keyhole is separating bicyclists from the roadway, um, it's separating bicyclists from pedestrians because they're going to go a little bit faster. Uh, looking at exclusive ped phases. So as Ryan said earlier, that exclusive ped phase gets the gives the chance for a pedestrian to get out at it in traffic or where traffic would normally be driving uh, without having to find a gap for themselves. Protected left turns are a good example. Medians are a good example, right? Um, even with cars, making sure that we can only turn certain places, separating them, um, whether it's multiple curve or not, um, potentially being able to bump somebody back into their lane if they're not really trying to get into the opposite lane. Um, but that is that's one of the probably easiest ones to understand is is that uh, the, the separation. The other thing that starts to get a little bit more um, in the weeds, I guess, is conflict points. So the idea of conflict points has been around for a, uh, a good while. The and it's a, it's measure it's a measure of exposure, right? Um, where it's a location where two users or vehicles. Um, vehicle, pedestrian, whatever, where they can legally be, but not physically be at the same time without a conflict. Um, <clears throat> so if you're looking at the, the diagram on the left with fewer conflicts, that turning movement, 
is crossing two through movements. And then there's an additional conflict where the main line right turn and that person left turning can conflict at the same time. Those are all conflict points, right? And traditionally, we've looked at all of those conflict points and tried to reduce or eliminate them. However, when we start looking at fatal and serious injury only, then we acknowledge that a higher risk conflict point has more weight than a lower risk conflict point. Uh, so not just fewer conflict points. So when we're dealing with angle crashes, like in this example, then they're kind of weighted the same, right? So the fewer is better in this case. Um, but when we start looking at instead of that turn into that side street, if we looked at what happened down the road when the, the person turning left first came out of out of their location, um, instead of going straight across the median opening, that's where you start to see things start to split up, right? It starts because you start reducing the the, the kind of the T-bone opportunities and making them more of the side swiper end, which are generally uh, less severe. So before I get too far, since we're going to talk a little bit more about that, any, any questions on, on exposure and limiting exposure? I generally have a question slide after every like main idea we do. All right. So, so our next idea is improving decision making, right? So how, we do this with simpler decisions, um, reducing the amount of information that we need to get the decision right, uh, separating decisions. So that means we only have to make one at a time or even um, uh, increasing the distance between them and giving people more time to decide, uh, you know, where you're not it's not as time sensitive. There's a certain amount of reaction time that people can have. Um, and people aren't always good at making a logical a logical choice. So what does that look like? It can look like better wayfinding, um, spacing your decision points out along a roadway, not cramming. Like if you have an off ramp and then immediately after that, you've got some choices and where you've ha you have to go like can we extend that out so you don't it's not immediately okay i have to merge and then oh crap i gotta make a decision um limiting opportunities to make bad decisions so protected versus permissive phasing is one of my favorite if you know you're looking at a 99 percent success rate in trying up angle and left turn crashes and then re once again reducing the information to make a good decision um back plates are an example of this right the retroflective back plates it's it's improving the quality of the information that you're having to make a decision. So your decision that you have to make is, should I stop or should I keep going? Um, if the signal head is backlit by the sun, for instance, it reduces your ability to get that information from that signal head. So being able to do a retroreflective backplate calls attention to it, as well as blocking out some of that kind of glow around from the, the sun helps with that quality of decision. Lighting helps with the quality of decision you're able to make. Um, you know, when we talk about, say, pedestrians under the influence and someone uh, is in the roadway or maybe they're not, maybe they're just crossing the road and they didn't see a vehicle uh, to give the driver the time to react. Lighting helps with that. So you're improving that decision making, um, being able to judge distance is a big one. You know, at night, um, depth perception can sometimes get a little wonky. So being able to provide the visual information to help with your depth perception helps that information you need to make a decision uh, and even calling attention to stuff right so looking at that picture of a crosswalk um, it's providing additional emphasis on the roadway that something's going on and we start to get those standard signs that's one of the reasons why standard signs are so important with the METCD um, while it can get frustrating sometimes with what the information we want to convey it sets up a driver expectation of knowing that when I see this this is what's going to happen uh, there, I see this, there are pedestrians on the road or there could be, I need to pay attention. Looking at wayfinding. So this is a diverging diamond on I-75 and University in Sarasota area. Um, there was a lot of concern when it first came out. Nathan Benderson Park's down on the, the bottom left of your screen. There's a lot going on here. It's very, very busy. There's a lot of concern about, you know, you're putting people on the wrong side of the road. This is going crazy. What's going to happen? But when you actually get down to the street level and you start driving it, the, the signage and the pavement markings um, 
make it very intuitive. You don't even realize what's going on unless unless you know bigger picture. And all you do is you follow the instruction. You just it, it's it's very it's the decision making is either taken away or it's very, very simple to make. Say I want to do this, therefore I am here. Um, roundabouts, multi-lane roundabouts. If you think about the pavement markings going into those, uh, we have in pavement markings so that you have time to get into the correct lane to be able to exit the roundabout when you want, right? <clears throat> Spacing out decisions, uh, looking at a managed corridor where the access management is managed. You don't have, um, say, a five or seven lane section here, this would be a seven lane section where there there's constant conflict um this is something where the conflict is spaced out when you come out from your side street you've got to be you getting into the left turn lanes you're not making a ton of stuff a uh, ton of decisions right off the bat uh and this is an example of permissive bathing right um you know granted it's a red light now but if you think about permissive phasing right that through queue that's what you would be seeing and trying to find a, a gap. So if you're dealing with 45 mile an hour traffic, uh, multiple lanes, start, especially let's say add other conditions, adverse weather, lighting, uh, or lack of lighting, it starts to become a lot more challenging to find the gaps, especially in very busy corridors. You're talking about aggressive drivers. You're getting people honking behind you because they think you should have gone, but they're not the one that's in the, you know, in the driver's seat at that time. Um, being able to remove that decision from the person so they don't feel rushed, they don't feel like they have to get it, uh, helps with mitigating bad decisions. Um, and then when we start getting into alternative intersections, right? This is a good example too of you only have to look at the the vehicle right next to you, right? Like there's there's really two decisions that you make in a roundabout. Um, there's the decision of lane choice with the multi-lane roundabout. This one, you don't have to do that, but with the multi-lane one, which lane do I get in um, as I approach it? And then once I'm there, is there, am I going to hit this car when I pull it? Um, so it, it greatly, all, all of these opportunities are working on decision making because we acknowledge that once again, like that vision zero philosophy, right? People are flawed. We know that people are going to need help. We know that we have all, you know, Katie was talking earlier about uh, people in the lane next to her when uh, with the lane assist or the, not the lane assist, but the um, the notification that there's someone next to you in your mirrors, the indicators. Um, understanding that that's information that she had to perceive and then make a decision to move into it. I've done the same thing where you don't realize that someone's there when you go. The Motorcycle Safety Coalition talks about this a lot, like being able to recognize people. Um, there's a lot of those decisions and being able to help take that load, decision making load from someone and make it for them. Um, or in a way that supports them making healthy decisions helps remove some of those the, and mitigate some of those problems with the, the users of the roadway. Um, any questions on that so far? Comments, input? Billy. I, I guess I just wanted to know like, from experience implementing some of these stuff, like how much in terms of like public coordination is required? Because I'm sure, you know, some of the implementations, public feedback might not be, uh, uh, I guess, happy uh, in terms of like, I guess, roundabouts, for example, or even DDIs. Like, I guess, how much in terms of like, you know, early awareness um, strategies that you need to do, I guess, for, for stuff like these? I mean, there's, there's not a straightforward answer to that, right? Because it's highly dependent on um, your area and the people that you're working with. But I think part of it is on us to figure out the conversation part. Um, you know, whether it's doing like. We can no longer walk into an area and say this is the right answer because we said so, right? Um, so like with roundabouts, there's a lot of work that District 1 did. Um, you know, we had a uh, Jack I think I mentioned Jack a few times ago. We got involved in that one and making sure it was safe, even though it wasn't our roundabout because it was giving roundabouts a bad name. Um, we did a lot of after studies to show like, hey, basically, like if you do this, like here's the results of what we've seen in areas similar to yours. 
Um, we had a developer that was very against roundabouts and we converted him once he saw like we convinced him to, to go forward with it once he saw it and it worked. Um, we kind of got him to come in and say, no, like this is this is great. This is phenomenal. Um, so I think if you're trying something new in an area. Going for the small wins is key, like finding the areas where you're going to get success to build your case before you go after the. Um, the really hard areas. So that could be a contentious area, but there's a really good safety justification. Like there's an overwhelming safety justification that you can use. That could be an area that like our some of our first roundabouts were in um, out of the way, low volume, rural two lane roads. And we got those to show people they weren't scary and then slowly started building into it. Um, I think having Figuring out the person's value system and connecting to it is going to be key. Um, I, the, the way I try to pitch it, and for especially with access management, because um, that's always contentious, you, your data has to be exemplary, but it will never convince people. Like, right? So data, data is is the is where people will make it wrong. They'll find the chink in your data, in your logic, in your solutions. And they'll use that to drive the chink to say no, this shouldn't happen. But you will you will very very rarely convince people with data. So you've got to have very thorough and accurate data as your foundation. And then after that, it's the conversation about what's going on and convincing people to build that trust. Um, as an organization, that takes a lot of time to do. Um, <clears throat> and conversations. That being said, there's always going to be people that you will not convince. Um, there's, I think of, I guess, three main points with that. Um, uh, City of New York decided that they were going to just move forward with things that they knew. So like we, we talk about with the morality, like we know if we know that we can save lives by doing this, is there a moral issue to not doing that? Um, city of New York, I listened to a uh, presentation from their city engineer back when they started the Vision Zero process and they basically said once we decide we decided that we weren't going to listen to public opinion when it came to safety features because we knew that this wasn't a policy decision this isn't a preference of community decision this was a if we don't do this there is a drastic effect in somebody's life um decision there's that i mean we have had I've done a lane repurposing public hearing when I was at the state and we had a guy come in and threaten to kill us all over um repurposing lane. Um, we did a roundabout public hearing and we had a woman. There was a trying to connect with this woman. There was a school down the road, um, down the inner the side street. And we were talking about, you know, like school children, like uh, helping like people get through the roundabout, the buses and this, that and the other, because there was a, actually a bus accident, I believe, uh, like a year before that. And she looked at me, she goes, well, like, why do we care about school children? Um, kids have never done anything useful in their life. Um, they haven't, you know, uh, contributed to society. Why do we care? And like that was that was the one of those times where it's like I just stop the conversation and I just walk away, right? Because at that point, there's nothing that I could like. Our value systems are so completely far apart. There's nothing that I can say that's going to affect that. Um, so I do think that there's there is a certain acknowledgement that. There's going to be some people that aren't going to say anything and that we still have to do what we know to be the right thing. But then the other part of it is how do we and we know we have to get the the data and the, the accuracy and the thoroughness, but it's that middle gray area, right? Where it's like, and that's where we as engineers and planners, where we're used to doing the technical part, we have to work on the human part and work on figuring out that conversation. Like there's no tricks. It's just, it's like any, it's like any relationship. Like if you're in a like in a marriage or a friendship or whatever, and it's and it's the communication's not going well. Like there's no easy trick to fixing it. It's always that that hard human conversation and trying to get through it. That work? Yes, I'm not smart. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, it does perfect. Thank you. All right, and I see there's I think there's three hands up, but I uh, Lois is the first one I think. I don't know if it fits exactly under exposure, but, but people certainly increase their exposure to crashes by being impatient and selfish. 
I can't tell you how many times I've ridden the bus where the bus driver had to slam on the brakes because someone darted across the lane to get into some establishment or people that don't want to miss a turn. So they'll go through multiple lanes to make their turn as opposed to going up and making a U-turn. Um, I don't I guess that's, are there, are there ways to deal with impatience and, and selfishness and all of this? So while I don't think we can uh, solve societal's problems and get world peace, um, I, I what I would pose, I would, I would turn this back on you and say, if you were designing and you know that regardless of the root cause of those behaviors, if you know the outcome of those behaviors, like basically how, what they're going to do, as opposed to how they're feeling, how would you solve that with design? If you are responsible for fixing that, or at least mitigating it, what would you do? Well, the way roads are now, I don't think you can do it through design. It's through having people be more aware of their own behavior. But also, the bus drivers are trained, I'm sure, to anticipate people doing that. So it's it's not it's it's a conundrum. For not really answering your question, but I, it's a part of the picture of, and it's interesting to me that the focus now seems to be on, it's not manipulation, but how can you help people make wiser decisions? And that's through design and through other things. And also, I think people, societal type things, awareness, uh, and so forth. But I, well, I don't think there's a, um, Once again, like public involvement, I don't know that there's necessarily an easy answer, but I think the, the easiest answer or solution to that, for instance, would be speed calming, right? Because if you know people are going, if you can't prevent, if you can't prevent the actions, we can still reduce the consequences. Um, Lori, I think you're the next person. Thank you. Um, I. I just keep thinking about the spacing decisions and then the medians and then converting them to directional median openings. Uh, how do you, when you make those decisions, do you have to look in, in at the greater radius to see if it's, is it just the general rule that it, it's going to lead to, it's going to reduce fatal and serious crashes if you make them directional and regardless of what's going on to the north or the south or where people are going to end up turning. Like if you have one specific project area and and you may not be able to to adjust other intersections or you know, you how do you, you should. When you're dealing with access management. In an ideal world, you should never make a decision at a singular location by itself. Um, you should always look for the logical termini. So whether that <clears throat> it, you're doing a corridor project and you say you're looking at intersection, like signalized intersection, signalized intersection, but when you're looking at access management, um, the traffic that you were displacing or the, the traffic movements that you were preventing or whatever, you need to follow that downstream. Right, because you don't want to fix safety here, but then just push the issues to the next two median openings and cause issues there. Right, so there needs to be in that evaluation a holistic look about hey, if people can't do this, what are they going to do, and and how are we going to accommodate that? Um, Julia. Yeah, I'm just curious. I have never understood why there's so much pushback against roundabouts. Um, like I personally find them pretty simple to understand, but I don't know. I've just always wondered, like, what is the issue with them? Like, is it education? Is it exposure? Is it design? Like, do they need to be designed more clearly for people who aren't used to them to understand? Like, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that, because I personally don't get why people aren't on board with roundabouts because I think they're awesome. So what I what I have seen, um, so the easy, the easy one, um, we put a lot in the Manatee Sarasota area and there's a lot of transplants from New Jersey. New Jersey had traffic circles and there's a very big difference between traffic circles and a modern roundabout. 
um, a lot of the traffic circles New Jersey did go through and start removing, but they replaced them with modern roundabouts because there was an issue like with people getting caught inside, kind of like that. Uh, wasn't there a um, Chevy Chase movie about that where they just kind of went around the whole thing? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so vacation. There you go. <clears throat> Was that Ben? Yes. Yes. Um, so I think that was there. There was some of that in it. I think of kind of like I drive on the roads. They're from a traffic engineer. Where there, uh, or even the um, I can't think of the name of the effect. There's an effect like that where like you know a little bit, so your confidence in it gets really big until you start to learn more, and then it drops off. Um, the Turing effect, maybe. Um. So I think there's a little bit of that. I think part of it too is it's not something that people know and people get very scared of things they don't know. Um, or at least there's personality types that do. So you hear a lot of this will never work. Um, trucks can't do it. It's going to be, you know, there's a lot of doomsday headlines when they come in. Um, and then I think the, because they don't see how people are going to manage conflict. And then you've got the people I think that with a roundabout, right? You have to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna use this word like they're they're socially messy versus a traffic signal. Um, because a traffic signal, you just have to sit there and do what you're told. Um, with whereas with a roundabout, you have to make this. You've got to interact with other people in the roundabout, um, and pick the right place to get in. So I guess I would say my my opinion is that it's a combination of of all of those things because it is weird. There is a an acceptance of a traffic signal without there being acceptance of a roundabout, even though a roundabout vastly outperforms traffic signal in a lot of circumstances. Or even like a four way stop, which essentially is forcing you to do something similar, where you're interacting with other drivers instead of with the signal, mm -hmm. but people don't go up in arms about it so it's weird I, I think a lot of those are is exposure right like we struggle with I'm trying to think how far to get into this um we we struggle with exposure sometimes to new ideas um, That's what i was gonna say change yeah change is one of the things you gotta overcome and i, and I think that's it's easier mentally to 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 fall in line with the things that you always know are simple, clear answers when roundabouts don't always offer a simple, clear answer. Um, Tracy? Yeah, I just want to, uh, I think I have some point um, to answer Lois' question. When, because I personally experienced that two days ago uh, when I was driving and there's a, uh, a car like trying to change from the rightmost lane to the left lane. I have to cr cross like four four lanes. And, and that car almost gets involved he, by someone or he's someone like many times. He was trying to do that suddenly. And so I think that's a behavior issue, first of all. So education for, you know, for uh, drivers, how they drive if, if they unfortunately missed um, the direction like a left turn lane, they should continue to, you know, on the roadway if they did not have time to make that movement and, and make you return somewhere. So that's part of, you know, education. Uh, I think that's going to work. And also, uh, what do we have learned in module three, safe system approach and redundancy? It, it's this is a kind of great example for redundancy. So the roadway, we want to kind of remind the road user, you know, like there's signal ahead, there's like street, like for example, commercial boulevard ahead. And so you, you, sometimes you have one sign based on the multicity, right? Like uh, um, advanced signage. And sometimes redundancy, I, I think it, 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 if you have like one more sign, so people will see it and that kind of keep reminding them where their destination should go. And so they can be prepared that they don't have to make that kind of uh, uh, sudden, sudden, uh, sudden movement. <clears throat> and also, yeah, like Nathan mentioned, the proper speed can, can be helpful for this kind of situation to avoid the, um, 
the collision. Yeah, for roundabout, uh, question about the roundabout, I also, um, yeah, so when, when we do ice, the uh, ice analysis for intersections, roundabout definitely is one of the important options. And so the reason lots of times we could not do it because they, um, it's not because we don't want to do it, it definitely can reduce the severity of the crashes. And it's because sometimes it's not feasible. You don't have a right way to do it. And sometimes it's a high speed road and you don't want people suddenly like slow down and, and go around and there's not much traffic. So there's many, many things to decide if that roundabout is appropriate for the like specific location. But it's definitely a, a great um, safety kind of measure uh, to reduce the severity of crashes. Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. Brad, one more and then we'll keep moving. Yeah, I was in reference to the to transit stop location. I guess, you know, the 436 project had kind of references to of, of moving those, relocating those as part of projects. And I guess it's been my experience in District 4 that, you know, we kind of give the transit agencies a lot of leeway of where to put those and move them around is how they see fit and with, without really a lot of oversight of maybe the best safety decisions of where those should be. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if, if is that is that some experience on 436 where they actually DOT took a more forceful role in like dictating transit stop location. Um, oh, sorry. I think good. I was going to say because so District 1's working on stuff like that, too. I don't and Ryan, you might talk specifically about that project. I don't think it's necessarily dictating as much as it's partnering. Yeah, because um, the transit agency doesn't want to put things in um, in dangerous locations either. And they would like, I think, the protection, right? It, it helps because the transit agency wants ridership. They want it to be safe. Um, I think the, the thing is, is traditionally there hasn't been a lot of conversation. Traditionally, like this, um, that there's been a like, this is our road. We're just what we're doing. You can adapt to it as you need to. And then the transit agency comes in, well, this is where I want my stop. You can adapt to it where you want to. Um, I know in District 1, they've made a huge push this last year or two towards transit agencies and trying to get, um, they were basically given the charge, uh, okay, Secretary Nandum, given the charge of, um, if you didn't have any money, how would you solve transit problems? <laughs> Which, I don't know if that's a hypothetical, because I don't know that we have <laughs> money to do it. But what they did is they, they started going and having the conversations, and they realized that the transit agencies half the time aren't talking to the MPOs. They're not talking like the local aid, like basically the, the, the um, MPOs and TPOs, the transit agencies, the local governments and DOT all were not talking. Um, everybody had their own plans, doing their own things, um, and they weren't having the conversations together. And when they started having the conversations together, uh, there was a lot of things were able to kind of line up because they realized that their goals were the same and if they just talk to each other, they would start working out. I'm not going to say that's not going to, that's going to occur perfectly in every situation, but that was one of the big things they found. Yeah, for, for that, I think years ago, D4 also trying to have that kind of, well, we're trying to partnership with them to, you know, understand, um, you know, relocating some bus stop uh, is very important. While we tried, we had meetings, we trust the agency, and it was, well, we were able to move one, only one, but like 90% of the time, you know, you, you see lots of recommendation for like relocating bus stop um, in the safety study report, but barely any anything, um, barely they would agree with anything. Because I kind of, from those meetings with trust agency, um, my understanding is their concern for safety is more for their bus safety and not for the pedestrian safety. So for bus safety, they want to have bus stop like um, in the like nah, in the in the near side of the intersection, and we want that in the far side. So it's kind of um, not not the same interest. And also, they are more they're more concerned about the business owners, like you know, plaza. And if that plaza entrance is right like in the middle of the 
um, not at the intersection, in, in the, um, there's like in the between two intersections, and they will have bus stop there. So especially the customer or workers can get off the bus and to cross wherever convenient for them. And I, I, we asked them, we, we told them, you know, it's not safe for the pedestrian and even for their workers, but they're, they're like, no, they don't, they did not want to move it because those business owners will kind of complain to them. So their interests are very different. So I think that's also back to the partnership and education. Um, yeah, with more communication, hopefully they can understand you know, the pedestrian safety. Because no, I don't really feel like the the their concern is more for pedestrians, they're more for business owner and bus safety. Yeah, the interests are so different. Yeah, that, that's I've been that's been my experience too, Tracy. It's really like their bus driver safety operational, less so than what pedestrians might do crossing at a transit stop or getting to another bus connection. And that's why I think a larger conversation with them is kind of needed about that for some of these points we're we're hitting on. Yeah, exactly. Hey, hey Lori, um, it's a good conversation. Can I get through? I think I'm, gonna be, I'm actually going to go through two sections to get through this like thought process, and then right before we get to CMFs, can I get your question then? All right, sweet. All right, so the interest of time, um, getting into reducing chaos. Um, <clears throat> so like just some questions, right? Do all, do all the users know when they should go, where they should go, and how to do it? Um, are the decisions that a road user make very simple and straightforward? Um, you know, I, I see this, on the on the interstate and the turnpike a lot, right? Because I don't drive it that much. And there's times that I'm sure all the local drivers know exactly where to go, but I find myself like last minute trying to jump into a queue because I had no idea that um, you know, this exit here backs up two miles in the afternoon. I thought I still had two miles to go and I was fine. Um so it's one of those like, you know, that that could be an ITS solution. Like, so do we um especially if we we assume people are driving with phones, but they may not be all the time is it clear where people need to go because some of those last minute like jerk you know jerk the wheel overs can also be because it, it kind of sneaks up on you and it may be assumed that you know say maybe from an aerial for some of those familiar with the area that it's it's clear but it may not be clear um you know pedestrians would be a big one we've done a lot of stuff back and forth of where to put pedestrian buttons for which direction you want to cross like are we making that abundantly clear uh what are clues that each of the road readers users that they might perceive at this location might be misunderstood is there something that's that's not as as clear cut as we would like um are decisions that you'll be forced to make intuitive or they require you to sit there and think about it complex decision making so you know going in uh you know we did these i put these slides together specifically for lori i knew she was going to be asking about this we did it you know two months ago knowing it was going to happen so let's look at this full meeting opening, right? Two side streets. Um, so you know we're we're looking to our left. We're seeing two lane in this case, two lanes of traffic oncoming. Um, we're looking to the right in this case. It's clear, but uh, generally there's traffic oncoming. There could be traffic as well inside that two a left turn lane. And we're looking at traffic coming across from us. Um, that traffic could be crossing traffic. It can, it can be turning either direction, either way that traffic is going to be impacting what we do and whether or not we can make the movements that we want to. And none of us know what each other's doing, right? So when we when we sort this out and we start looking at conflict points, you know, coming from the side street, if I turn right, I have a conflict with this the driver in the the outside lane. If I'm going straight across the street, you know, I have five separate conflicts there. I've got a conflict with every through lane and every movement that's happening inside the um the two-way left turn lane and then let's say someone is cutting cutting the corner when they're turning left from the opposing side street they're also going to hit me and then if i turn left i have multiple angle crash opportunities um opportunities to get hit inside the two-way left turn lane as well as the actual lane that i'm turning into and every single one of those are decision making points because if someone's vying for that position over me, I have to anticipate. You know, if I'm trying to do one stage uh, going across the road and someone decides that they're going to turn out in front of me, 
uh, to turn left at that point? Do I have to stop in the middle of the road? Like all of that's going on at the same time. And if it's not busy, it's an easy decision to make and the freedom to do it is, is, is great. But if it is busy um, and say you're trying to turn left, someone else behind you is trying to turn right and they're tired of you, uh, they start honking, it creates a sense of urgency. It starts to get hard very, very quickly, right? <clears throat> so we start adding good access management in there. We start getting um, conflict points that look like this if you're trying to turn left. Um, so that when you're turning right, uh, you're looking at one direction of traffic in one lane. And that's generally either side swipe or rear end if it becomes a conflict. Then you've got to merge you know, one or two lanes, depending on what the typical section is, and that's a side swipe every time if it becomes a crash. But you only have to pay attention to the traffic right next to you. Then you got to merge into the, the turn lane, and then when you get to the turn lane, you're either looking straight at or to your right, you're looking at the traffic oncoming and you're making a decision there. Sometimes you're also dealing with the side street, but you're still, there's there's only a very small window of time where that's an angle crash. It st still can, but you're reduced from just a small section that's an angle crash versus the almost the entire stretch of the previous condition that's an angle crash, right? For the most part, what you're doing is you're simplifying your decision making because you're only doing one movement at a time. You're simplifying the amount of decision that you have to take in because you're you're reducing it to essentially one direction at a time that you have to look at. And then the reducing the consequences in most cases if something does occur because you're changing the type of conflict point. So one of the big questions is what's the likely consequence? Like when we're looking at that safe system approach, right? Because with safe system, we're, we want we want there to have to be multiple failures to occur before there becomes a serious injury or fatality. We don't want any single failure to happen um, and cause that. So asking ourselves, what's the likely consequence if someone failed to negotiate the intersection or roadway segment? It's um, lane departure, right? So the three ways of dealing with lane departure we'll learn is keeping people inside their lane, allowing for a safe recovery, and then reducing the consequences if they can't. So when we look at things like guardrail, um, barrier wall, that's in the reducing the consequences, right? That's not, the, the idea there is that you're putting an obstruction in the roadway that is less worse than the obstruction that's it's protecting. Um, so if, someone leaves the road and they're gonna hit a bridge pier. Instead of a bridge pier, they may hit an attenuator or side swipe a guardrail instead, right? So, so that's what we're at. That's what we need to be asking is not just what's the best case scenario, but in worst case scenario, if something happens, what do we need to do in our design or our countermeasure process to keep this from happening? And if something does happen, how do we minimize the consequences? So lowering speeds, um, Lois was talking about, you know, and that, that's that's the big thing, right? Because designing for users is hard, so it's easy to say, well, it's a user problem. It's not our problem. But we do have an effect. There is an effect that we can have on that, right? Lowering speed limits helps. It. It's cross-cutting. And in pretty much every instance, lowering the speed on the roadway helps with that. Changing your conflict points helps with that. Protecting your hazards using, using different types of barrier. Um, all of these things help mitigate those consequences. Getting back into lowering speeds, right? Um, depending on the speed range, your stopping distance is, is lessened, right? Um, you have more time to react to something. Your crash risk increases, the speed increases, as well as your fatality risk. Like, it, it, you know, we, we've talked about before that there's certain ideas that we want um, people to come away with. Um, one of the big ones that we're going to get at through all of this is that Controlling speed is the single most effective thing that we can do to prevent fatal and severe injuries. Um, not only does it reduce the crash risk by lowering speeds, but your fatality risk is drastically um, improved as well. Changing conflict points is the other part, right? So if we look at um, impact speed versus the, the the escalation of death so the, these speeds don't mean that you're going to die what it means is that your risk of death start it's it's when it starts to get exponential um so head-on crashes looking at 40 you know around 43 miles an hour side impact 31 miles an hour 
um, impact with objects. So like if you're rolling or flipping and you hit a telephone pole, it's 19, and then that 20 mile an hour risk with um, uh, unprotected people. So whether pedestrian, cyclists, or motorcyclists. Um, this is like when we're thinking about this, think about all the facilities that we have where like these speeds are over this amount and what type of crash types we're going to see on that corridor. So like if you're looking at a corridor and you're saying, hey, like we have um, so going back to like Lori's questions, right? Um, or and actually Brad is a little bit in there as well, because when you start getting with access management, for instance, you start getting a lot of political pushback. You start getting a lot of pushback from people that want to be able to turn left wherever they feel like it because they that's survivorship bias, right? Because they haven't had an issue yet. Um, doesn't mean you should restrict them. Um, if if you're getting to a point where you can't make those changes, making speed changes can help mitigate that crash, that high um, high injury or fatal crash risk, even if you can't stop the actual accident from happening. Um, and just you know, protecting hazards. Um, one thing to note with these is being careful. Um, this like maintenance and construction. This is critical. Um, proper installation of these is 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 extremely important. Um, there was a report done a while back with Florida, with Florida um, attenuators and guardrail, um, and we did not do well with it. Um, these are these are designed to work with a perfect installation. Um, so. Coming from construction, I know sometimes there's things people like don't do and it's it's one of the well, it's close enough. It's not close enough when it comes to these. Um, if we don't get these right, these have a tendency, uh, especially this one here where it's supposed to curl. Um, if somebody hits uh, like these type have a tendency to go through the vehicle and everyone that's sitting inside of them. Um, so just making sure that when we're doing these, we all have a part in making sure that it not only is it called for and it's got it, it's in the correct location, but also it's installed perfectly. All right, so that's the that's the big idea. That's the end of the big ideas of what we're trying to do with countermeasures. And if you start thinking about some of the, a lot of the popular countermeasures, a lot of those fit into some of those neat ideas of decision, of decision making. You know, once we get outside the physics of driving a car. Um, so I do want to start up here. We're going to start getting into CMFs. And if you haven't dealt with CMFs, it's going to be a bit of a chunk to bite into. Um, <clears throat> any questions? And this is a good part, you know, we've got um, an hour to go over. If we if we had 11, you know, if we can take questions to 11, if you want, um, we've got a way to go over. So anything else? I know, Lori, you had one that you were holding on to. I'd like to keep holding on to it, please. OK, okay thank you. Anything on those sections at all? Because we're we're gonna shift gears in the next session. All right. So the next section is how do we determine appropriate countermeasures? Looking at good data, good analysis, identification of causes, countermeasures linked to causes. Proper implementation and measures of success. There's a lot of information out there. Um, NCHRP, there's a ton of NCHRPs out there. Uh, Series 500 has a lot of information. Series 500 has a bunch of different books that are that all get into very specific um, solutions. Uh, there's more research every year that comes out on different types of stuff. Um, FHWA has their top 28 proven safety countermeasures. It's 28 countermeasures that FHWA has identified are highly effective at making a positive difference in safety on the roadways. Um, State of Florida has the gold star countermeasures. These are also in the PSEE module. And it's countermeasures that are, and you'll see as we get into this, this the clearinghouse, but it's countermeasures that have been found to have a good degree of effectiveness as well as um, a, a good degree of reliability. Uh, and because reliability is important as well, right? Um, 
So if you don't want to get into all of that, <clears throat> um, the CMF clearing house is, is generally where you can find the majority of countermeasures. Um, the clearing house has, uh, you can put in um, what you're thinking about using, right? And what it what it'll end up doing is spitting out the CMF, the CRF, and those are just an inverse of each other, essentially. Um, it's called crash modification factor and crash reduction factor. So a measure of how effective the countermeasure is, and then it shows um, the degree of confidence in that countermeasure, and it'll give a link to the studies. So you can actually go in and see, does the study, is this similar to what I'm doing? What kind of quality is it? Uh, is it something that I should really be looking at? So this, the idea of CMS and things like that is important to look at because it's good from our perspective, and it's also how we look at the same benefit cost analysis. Um, it's also very important as you get further on the safety journey, starting looking at predictive analysis. So it's a crash modification factor. Uh, CMF is a measure of effectiveness of how effective you that that particular countermeasure is at changing the crashes associated with it. CRF is just a crash reduction factor. Um, it starts. It's really we're going over this so that you understand the jargon. Um, but really, CMF is one of the big ones to to understand. It's also a measure of effectiveness. Um, so a CRF is the percentage reduction of crashes, and the CMF is essentially what the new amount of crashes would be. Um, so if you had a if you had 100 crashes and you applied a countermeasure that addressed those and it had a CMF of 0.75, you'd be left with 75 crashes. Your CRF would be 0.25, so there's a 25% reduction. That's that's how they kind of they work with each other. Um, and you can see it here, uh, just talking about um, they used a 0.15 in this case. So a CRF of 0.15 means there's a there's 15% less crashes. If it's a negative value, it means there's 15% more. With your crash modification factor, just the inverse of it, 0.85. There is 15% um, fewer, 1.15, there's 15% more. So where do we find them? Um, Florida DOT has a few. Um, we also have some, what's called a, um, SPF safety performance factors that's that's similar but not the same. So don't get confused with those. The highway safety manual, but then CMF clearinghouse is the probably the easiest and most accessible to use. Um, this is the clearinghouse. Uh, you can it's cmfclearinghouse.org. You can also just Google CMF clearinghouse if you forget about it and it'll take you there. Um, but you can see the fields at the top where you input the countermeasure name, which is what you're looking at and they will spit it out for you. Um, probably not, but just quickly, any questions on that so far? Everybody understand at least what a, what a crash modification factor is? All right. So when we're looking at a project, <clears throat> um, we put multiple countermeasures in, or maybe we have multiple countermeasures for one particular Thing, right? Let's say we're trying to prevent um, run off the road crashes in a curve and we're doing rumble strips, we're doing chevrons, we're doing um, flashing beacons, we're doing lighting. Like, can we take all of those CMFs and add them up together to get our reduction? No. So we need to be very, very careful when we're combining CMFs. It doesn't mean that you can't look at those to, to get an idea of how effective they are, but when you combine them, say, do a benefit cost analysis or something like that, um, or to get an expectation of total reduction, it doesn't work like that. So the HSM, um, it's kind of like the, the the total guidance. There is an NCHRP that's come out that's talked more about it, and it's going to be informing HSM 2.0. But for, for the HSM right now, 
Um, an SPF estimate is multiplied by, by a series of CMFs to adjust the estimated crash frequency from the base condition. So the base condition is what you're at right now to a future condition. The CMFs are multiple duplicative because the effects the features they represent are presumed to be independent. Um, and so what it's saying is that you can't, what you can do is essentially start to multiply instead of add, because you're saying that each, each individual CMFs, it has its own unique effect. Um, the limited understanding of interrelationships, the various treatments presented in Part D requires consideration, especially when more than three are proposed. So if CMFs are multiplied together, it's possible to overstate the combined effect of multiple treatments when it's expected that more than one type of treatment may affect the same type of crash. So it's getting into you can do up to three. You can multiply it to three. What this section is saying is you need to be careful doing it because even when you're multiplying it, you're still it's still not correct, right? Because anytime you the studies that were done are usually done on a specific set of circumstances with one countermeasure, and that's where you get the CMF. They're not done with all of them together in a holistic point. It's kind of like speed management, right? Like we know we can't just narrow lanes and accomplish a lower speed. We know that we've got to add in a lot of different stuff, but we're still figuring out what impact it all has and how we calculate that. <clears throat> um, when CMFs are multiplied, the practitioner accepts the assumption that the effects represented by the CMFs are independent of one another. Um, so it's saying like, be careful when you have multiple ones, multiple CMFs affecting the same thing. It's just more, it's not really new information. We're just saying, just adding to the idea of the HSM saying, be, be very, very careful. Um, engineering judgments is necessary um, in the use of combined CMS or multiple treatments change the overall nature or character of the site. In this case, certain CMS use the analysis of the existing site conditions and the proposed treatment may not be compatible. So it's kind of like uh, with you'll we'll talk about with crash data. If you're drastically changing what's going on, like you're going from a four way stop to a roundabout, you're really changing what's happening. So your four way stop condition. CMFs, unless your CMF is the roundabout, it's not as applicable to what's going on. Like if you're doing pedestrian CMFs, right? And you're trying to find out what pedestrians, uh, you're making a decision on what pedestrian facilities, the four-way stop, um, or approaching the four-way stop, what, what's going to be effective in the future, make that decision on what the pedestrian facilities need to be around the roundabout. They're, they're not necessarily um, copacetic, right? They're, you have two differing conditions, so it's being very, very careful with that. All the other thing is to always use your caution when looking up and applying CRFs. Um, it's it's good. It's some of the best information we have, but it is not perfect information. Um, ultimately. My recommendation, you just don't don't combine them. Um, there's a an, the, the UNCHRP that come that's coming out or has come out. It's going to afford the HSM essentially says just that, um, that when you're starting to do multiples, you just pick the highest. Don't worry about multiplying. Don't worry about anything else. Um, just don't do it. Okay. While you technically can, and there are, like the predictive method, there are methodologies for doing it, at least at this level. When you're looking at, like, say, a project level, I have a design project, and I'm trying to figure out what to do. Just don't do it. Um, the other issue too is when it comes to the CRFs, it's great information. Don't use the CRFs either. Use the CMF. There is a bit of a difference between the CRF and the CMF. I know it's confusing. Um, it's very close to each other. It seems like it wouldn't matter. It does matter. Um, so once we get into that, right, where um, we can multiply very, very carefully. Recommendation, don't do it. Uh, consider how they are independent with each other. No more than three. Um, that's the technical way, but uh, like I said, I, I want to leave with a message of just be really careful doing that. Unless you're really comfortable doing it, um, it is technically true you can multiply, but, but I would consider them independent. Try not to do that. Most of you probably aren't going to be doing a benefit cost analysis to, or a predictive analysis, unless you say maybe you're a PD and E. Um, so you may not have to deal with that yet. When you do, there is more training to deal with it. At a project level, um, let's try not to make big statements about what multiple CMFs will do. 
let's look at the CMF to understand if we should or should not include it and how effective that will be, but not what its overall total effectiveness will be um, with a with other treatments, right? It's its reference point should be essentially doing nothing, or it should be a like a relative measure when we're starting to do that as opposed to an absolute measure. Any questions on that? Everybody, so everyone knows um, what a CMF and a CRF is. Everyone knows how to use a CMF. And everyone knows um, that you cannot add. You can multiply in very specific circumstances, but you have to be extraordinarily careful with it and that we probably shouldn't do it. So, Lori? Thank you. So for CMFs, is that when you're just kind of justifying why a modification or something is being made to a roadway or a decision like a design decision or some kind of safety feature? Is that the purpose of? There's there's a lot to CMF. So they're trying to quantify safety in the decision making process. Um, so there's a number of ways that you can use it. Uh, one is it with the predictive method. So there's something called safety performance functions. Where we. Have certain functions. Like a, like an equation essentially to try to figure out what's going to happen if we're making decisions. So. If. Say someone's in PDE, then that's a good example, right? You're trying to figure out what's the rough typical section and um, you know, different levels of PDE get different. Depending on the project, it can get closer to a certain level of design or further away. Um, the performance functions will help you make some of those decisions. Even in design, it can help as well um, of determining what that roadway needs to look like. And what you do is an input in that performance function is CMFs. So you say, I'm going to use these three things. Here's the crash modification factor for each. It's going to go in here and then what I end up doing is I get a number that says here's option A's number, here's option B's number, here's option C's number, which one has the best safety performance. Um, have you, you're in planning, right, Lori? Yes. Um, I don't know how granular you get, but it, like I think uh, in traffic ops, at least like uh, I don't know if I have a good example of planning, but like traffic ops, you have the the, um, the ice process, right? Spice X and CapEx. Um, they apply a bunch of different factors and then they give you like a rating. Like here's your rating for different types of intersections with different things in mind. It'd be similar to that, but on like a roadway scale. Um, the next place that you use them is doing benefit cost analysis. So when Tracy is justifying HSIP funds, um, she has to provide a benefit cost ratio. So she's going to say, we're we're proposing putting these improvements in. They have a service life of X number of years. So that service life that that the cost of that improvement is amortized over so many years, and you get a net present value. Um, you look at the crashes that are that are happening that you predict they're going to happen throughout the years, and you apply the CMF to it, and it essentially says, okay, there's going to be a reduction of this many crashes per year that crash has a dollar value attached to it and then you compare the essentially what the present day value is of those crashes which is the value of the improvement against the cost of the improvement and that's where you get your benefit cost ratio and that's how you help make decisions as well of what projects should be done or not the new safe streets for all grants um, are going very heavily over um, are, are heavily using um, benefit cost ratios for their implementation projects. And then what you can use it for on a project level, let's say uh, on, as a designer, is saying, hey, I, you know, I'm thinking I need to make some, I need to make some um, choices. So if I have Googled or I've gone on um, 
in the FDM, I've gone in, in CHRP, FHWA's website, I've gone wherever and found that, hey, here's some options that I can put into this, this project, right? Uh, so these are for, these are easy options to put. They're very, very cheap. How effective are they going to be? Because they also have this expansion, expensive option. Um, and while, you know, it, in my mind, we need to be, like, we shouldn't be necessarily cutting costs when it comes to saving people's lives. At the same time, we have a full system and work program with issues across the board. So if we can save 10 lives here and 10 lives here, you know, for $100,000 versus $10 million time saving 11 lives, like there, there is a, there's a reality to that, that we have to acknowledge. Um, so when you're making those decisions, I would say in planning, um, I don't know what specific spot you're in in planning, but like say a lot of the people okay. you work, what is it? Oh, we do access management. So I'm just thinking okay. about some of the decisions or comments or recommendations that we make. This may be helpful of making those decisions, what we're requesting or suggest suggesting. I, I think so. I think so access like management. Proposed developments. Yes, and access management, I think, so, right, so the, the issue with access management is it's it's not a technically challenging subject. It's challenging when it comes to people and politics and conversations. Um, <clears throat> so you're not going to have a ton of different CMS when it comes to a, a meeting. Like, you're going to figure out, here's my CMF for that, and that's it. I, I think where your CMS are going to come in is if you do additional on top of hey, we need to directionalize this. What do we do then? And it's also going to be part of the negotiation process. So let's say you find that you want to directionalize it and politically it's just dead in the water. No one's going to let you do that. Um, the CMF then allows you to help with that negotiation of if you're not going to give us this, then like we need all of these things as well to help mitigate that, that problem. Lois? Well, another part of what we, Lori and I do in planning is long range transportation planning. And when you talk about projects, it's in effect a sort of a piecemeal thing. It's a picture, it's one piece of a larger system. So it's sort of like this piecemeal, what is, you know, what's the big picture? But increasingly, our partners are doing speed safety plans or management plans, and we're doing target speed with context classification. There are a lot of moving parts. But ultimately, what's the best approach? And D4, Katie, you're on those calls. We're kind of grappling with what would be the best thing for us to do to understand how these things work at a project level, but then also at the system level or quarter level or whatever. So that's all part of the planning realm, I think. I think or related to it. And I think that's a really good opportunity because I want to because one of the like DOT is a matrix organization, right? And I don't remember if it's a strong matrix or weak matrix, but if you're not familiar with that term, it's how um, the organization of the structure is. Uh, the strong matrix and weak matrix is not a judgment. It is a it's saying whether it's um, stronger on the project side or stronger on the um, the functional unit side. And DOT is more strong on the the project side. <clears throat> But one of the big strengths of the department um, is that the process, like the, the department is a machine at being able to get projects through. And even though it seems like it takes a long time, um, we're dealing with very complicated projects and being able to get them from, you know, I have an idea to build on the ground is incredible. And I think that's one of the opportunities, even though it might take a bit of brain power to figure out what that process needs to look at look like. Once you solve it, being able to take advantage of that that work program machine is is an incredible opportunity. So when you when you when you and Katie and they all do figure that out, um, getting that into the you know the day to day, this is how we do business. Uh, it's going to be able to make incredible changes. Yeah, and it looks like increasingly our partners are going to have suggestions for us. <laughs> so that's part of, I mean, part that's, of this, this too. That's one of the things that we um, have identified, right, is that we can't build a road agnostic to the surrounding area. 
um, and we don't have control of the, the surrounding area. So, so what do we do? Um, I think it's interesting because I do think there is a conversation of what planners versus engineers do. Um, and I think sometimes that from an engineering perspective, like we maybe sometimes solve the wrong problem. Um, because I think about like the relationship between engineers and architects. Architects decide how the roadway, sh how the building should function, and engineers figure out how it stands up. And I wonder sometimes if, you know, we get into engineering of like going back to that level of service, like that, that's what our measure is. We are, we are designing for a level of service because that's how the roadway functions, but it's an engineering decision when maybe it's planning function, how it functions, because you're looking at how the roadway interacts with the surrounding area. And then once we decide how it should function, that's when an engineer is, does the, okay, this is what it's going to look like to function in that manner. Lori? Okay, I'm sharing the question I had on hold because right. your recent, what you just said, just triggered that light bulb. But I was wondering about transit, you know, maybe also transit's me measures and performance. Well, I mean, they have a very good need to be efficient and speedy because then it'll be more reliable for the users. But maybe, um, I don't know, when it comes to funding or grants or, or something, their own measures, maybe if they... If there was a push to include human safety in how transit is judged or viewed, that they may be more willing to make certain human pedestrian safety improvements because that would be infecting their performance. I mean, I think I think that's an accurate statement. I mean, that works for everything, right? Like if you look at the decisions that people make in their day to day jobs. Um, I mean, how, how many of you know what your EPS measures are? Like, and, you know, when you, when it starts getting time for your, uh, the, hopefully your supervisor is doing like quarterly or, you know, check-ins, things like that. But I, you know, I've been in units where it happens once a year and you start looking around at the measures, making, you know, proving that you've met it, you've taken your required trainings, you've done this, you, you have this level of performance. Um, what gets measured gets done. And especially when you start tying that to funding. Um, yeah, I remember uh, an airport we were dealing with um, that refused to come to the table. There was a development that went in the airport, filled in a retention pond, and just started pumping all the water into the right of way. And it was causing a massive issue. And the airport was basically like, screw you guys, like, we're not coming in. And then we got with our, um, our, modal folks and they're like hey well they want this grant from us we'll just hold the grant till they talk to you and the conversation happened very very quickly um so i think when you start tying that stuff in i think it it would definitely help i think stuff too you know getting on the transit um it, it may not be a popular idea but there's no way for us to build our way out of congestion uh because as soon as we in a congested area as soon as we make congestion better more people like there's a level of comfort people have with congestion like it's just going to fill up again um it's a losing battle so when we start looking you know to lois's point um about people moved um and start looking at stuff like that that's when transit starts becoming very popular um and being able to get the the predictability and the service in place to be able to get adoption any other questions So everybody's got CMFs, right? All right. So we talked about quality of CMS, and this is something you got to pay attention to when we're looking at CMFs. There's a few of them. This is one. Um, I'm not going to get. You don't need to really understand what's being talked about in these slides. These these slides' purpose is to communicate that there is a rigorous process behind why they have star or multiple stars. So the CMF Clearinghouse uses a star system where more stars you have, the better. And what it's saying is the quality of that study. So they could have a highly effective, it's like if you could have a, a highly effective um, countermeasure, like, you know, 75% reduction of all crashes in, is the CRF. Um, but it's based off of one study in one location that did not isolate for their variance. 
right? So when you start looking at, so what CMF Clearinghouse does is it assigns point values to certain rigor of analysis. So 55 points is the total number of miles sites, right? Like they're looking at how much data did you get? 75 points for how you did designed it, you address biases, um, what your statistical methodology is, uh, calculating the statistical CMF, or sorry, the statistical significance of the CMF, um, looking at how narrow your definitions is, the individual quality, appropriateness of combining statistical uh, significance again when you start looking at meta-analysis studies, when you start looking at meta-regression studies, um, methodology and data, the quality, appropriateness of statistical analysis, um, and eventually all those points add up to your star system. So they take all of this, like what, how rigorous is your analysis, um, assign the point value, and then compare the point value to these, um, these boundaries for your star ratings. That's what it means. So if you have a three star, you're looking at a, a significant reduction in the rigor compared to a five star study. So if we look at a PHB or a Hawk, right? Um, let's, what would the CMF be for the installation? <clears throat> so there's multiple countermeasures. <clears throat> so they come up, you've got to sort through them. So they're usually drop downs. You start looking at it. Um, here's four possible countermeasures. So when we look at it, we have the CMF. Um, so remember that point, uh, that point though is at seven, it's hard to see because my screen's a little blurry. I think 0.712. Um, that is, if we have 100 crashes and we, we would multiply that times 0.712, and that's how many crashes we would have left over, right? CRF is, there is a essentially a 29% reduction. This is a four star study. Um, so we're doing pretty good with that. The other thing that you have to look, look at are the crash types, what crash types it addresses. So you have all crash types, um, vehicle pedestrian crashes. And so that's usually like, if you're addressing uh, pedestrian crashes specifically, like that might be the one that you wanna use because you're specifically looking at the vehicle pedestrian crash as opposed to just every crash on the corridor. Crash severity, um, all crashes. Uh, so property damage only, your injury crashes and your fatalities, right? Like those are, those are the, the, your options for what's going on. Area type, um, urban and suburban. So not necessarily gonna be appropriate for if you're gonna use it in a rural location, you wanna be very careful doing it. Uh, the reference. So you can see that there's two different studies that were done. Um, they pull it from two separate ones. Um, I always get interested when I see a singular study for multiple um, CMFs, it kind of makes me curious to see like how they, they broke up what was going on. Um, and then it talks that read more lets you get into it more to actually see what's going on. And sometimes you can get access to the study to read what's, um, how they actually did it. So there is one on here with five stars. If we expand it a little bit much, it's still all crash types and all severities. But the fact that it's five stars, um, it is pretty good. So that's where you have to, as a practitioner, have to make a judgment call looking through it all to see, hey, do I want to go with something that's more specific or do I want to go with something a little more rigorous? And with specificity, is it is it meeting, is it, is it hitting all of the, the points that I needed to hit for that specificity? Uh, so we, we click into it, we start looking, it shows you different states that it went, um, it shows you the, the data range, um, the number of sites, it starts breaking down uh, what you're actually, what was actually viewed from the analysis. Uh, so just kind of getting into which one are you going to use, right? And we we talked about that. Um, it it this one's good because it's the the vehicle pedestrian crash, right? Um, we just. I, I don't know that I would use the five star just because it's not. Four star still really good. 
and I want more specific specificity because usually the more specific that you can get, the better analysis that you're going to do. Um, with that, since it's from the same guy, I probably I personally would probably get into the study to try to read a little bit more. Um, but you could also make a judgment of which one's more conservative. Uh, while it's good, well, it looks good when you have like super high reductions. Um, being conservative works because being, you know, going back and putting more safety into a project is really never a bad thing. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it is a judgment call on your side as to whether or not you want to do that. Um, so clicking that read more takes us back to this page and then getting into to study details. So it's a more recent study than the 2010 Texas AMN study. It gives a lot of details. It provides a link where you can download the study or even the study report for more uh, information. Um, and it even, it downloaded a, or sorry, it didn't download it. It developed a lot of other CMFs as well. You can click on that as well to get into all the different CMFs. Ultimately, as long as you're willing to like hunt into it and, and look through it, there's a lot of information associated with this and that helps you with your, your decision. Um, Ultimately, when you're looking at some of this, the, your question is precision versus accuracy. Um, my, there we go. <clears throat> so understanding that something can be very precise, but not necessarily accurate. So that's kind of like that five star study, right? That five star study um, has a lot of accuracy, but it's not necessarily precise. Because we're not homing in on the on the the crash types that we want, um, whereas holding in on the crash types can be more precise, but it may not be as accurate. In this case, I felt like it was an acceptable level level of accuracy. If you had like a two star, then you might start looking at that five star for all crashes over a two star for just the crash types that you want. It is a judgment call. Um, that is not what I was looking for. And that's just a, another note, like when we're starting to look at the accuracy and precision, it's just understanding that, um, and it's understanding what the study's doing, right? Like, there's not a simple answer sometimes for if we do this, it's just going to magically be good. It, it's needing to, to understand a little bit more about what's going on in the study to understand how precise it actually is. Any questions on the clearinghouse right now? I know that's a very... Like high level look at it. Um, it's very easy to navigate. The clearinghouse has a ton of help documents and brochures in there that you can click into to get a little more information as you go. I think my big idea is making sure that you're aware of it um, and you know the like the big ideas of what you need to be looking at. So any questions on that? Lori? For accuracy, well you just Reiterate what you're looking at for accuracy, whether it's going to be reflective on the project or the situation that you are doing now, or is that that's the precise part? So the the precise is it's like if your target, like if you if you if your target is um, Reducing angle crashes and access management. Um, precision is in my in my idea. Precision is how closely what you want to do addresses angle crashes, right? Um, your accuracy in that case would be how. Trying to think of how to use you answer it without using the words accurate and precise. Um, your accuracy would be how predictable your efforts are in total, whereas your precision is how is how much it addresses angle crashes. So, like in that hawk example of addressing vehicle pedestrian crashes. Um, it's very precise 
in the fact that we have a CMF that is specifically for vehicle and, and um, pedestrian crashes. That is that is a, a level of precision. But if it doesn't have a high accuracy, that CMF, your your standard deviation of that CMF could be very large. Um, whereas the five star has very high accuracy. Like we know like your, your, your standard deviation, like you're getting very, very tight with your standard deviation, but it's not necessarily precise in the fact that it's it's addressing everything as opposed to focusing just on vehicle and pedestrian crashes. And then, um, and I apologize if I mispronounce it, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Uh, Quitsia, I think you had a question earlier. I saw your hand pop up a while back and then it disappeared. Did you still have a question? Okay. So an example, um, and this one's not gonna have a good answer. So let's say we're going to enhance delineation. We have a two lane rural roadway, the ADT 16,000, nighttime wet weather crashes. Um, county maintains, not really appropriate, but I'm just setting the, setting the picture, right? Uh, currently there's no RPMs. So if we're looking at like that run off the road type crashes, our delineation is, is a good one. So nighttime wet weather, the, the ability to be able to see the lanes reflecting back at you because of the RPMs being on there. Um, so if we look at the CMFs for putting RPMs on a two-lane roadway, this is we get this table. Um, once again, always use caution, right? And we're gonna get into that in this, right? So when we get into the study, we found that they use snow plowable RPMs, right? Florida doesn't have snow. We don't have snow plowable RPMs. They're not inset like this. Does it make a difference? I'm not sure personally that it does, but it is something to understand um, because it is different conditions, and that's what that CMF was designed for. So we are, if we apply this CMF, it's not necessarily wrong, but it is imprecise to our conditions. Um, so what an RPM does, right, is it's providing that re that reflective point back to us and that feedback back to us while we're driving. If this will accomplish the same thing, my judgment would say we're still good because it's still providing that that um, that retroflectivity from my headlights back to me to delineate where I'm trying to drive. Now, if we keep looking into it, um, the bold text, the most reliable, the CMS have a standard error of 0.1 or less. That's your accuracy. Right, so we're imprecise, but there is some level of accuracy to what we're doing. What we we do see, however, um, is that some of these CMFs are all over the place, right? So this um, this point this one point one six is it actually shows an increase in crashes. The point one nine nine is not very effective. Point seven six is good. 0.43 is an increase in crashes. Um, so we still need to, to kind of dive into it. Why would it make sense for a safety issue to increase crashes? So if we actually get into the text of it, we get into the study, um, it starts talking about it. So those here, going back to it, right? If we look at when this shows up, um, it's a low volume roadway in this case. And then you're looking at very, very tight curves. Um, so very tight curves and low volume. What they think is that in, in this case, by providing that delineation, people felt more comfortable going faster. Um, they go faster either because of low volume or um, because it's a tighter curve and they started going speeds that were not appropriate. For the that um, the way the roadway was, right? I don't know that I would still hesitate putting these on there because it's still a unique circumstance. 
but that's why it's important to understand what's going on and how they got it. Uh, we also need to make sure it's it's nighttime. It's not necessarily applying to the daytime stuff as well, right? Um, but in that example, and go back to real quick, there's a lot going on. If we just looked at one CMF, it might not necessarily cover the situation that we have. Um, when we look at it, this this author was able to break out it, break it out by um, the radius of the curve. They were able to break it out by ADT. And even though this table only has nighttime, there's a daytime nighttime factor as well. Any questions on that example? Okay, I think the big idea is just be careful. So let's look at multiple CMFs. And this is probably what you might be dealing with, right? You have a signalized intersection in the 3R project. The intersection hasn't been updated in quite some time. And we're going to look at adding retroflective back plates to deal with the rear end crashes. Um, protective phasing to deal with angle crashes and then intersection lighting to deal with some of the nighttime crash patterns. So I'm going to I'm going to look at the retroflective sheeting to the signal back plates, right? The the problem with this one, though, is that it's not just rear end crashes, right? Like this is dealing with all crash types, all severities. We need to keep that in mind as we go forward with protected left turns. Um, we have a four star quality. We're specifically looking at angle crashes in this case um, and all crash severities. And then with intersection lighting, nighttime crashes, all crash severity. Um, three star, it's not as good. And that's, a that's, that's where we have to make a decision between are we going to go with greater accuracy with four star or better precision with the three star. Just breaking it down, you have uh, with back plates, you have a quality, um, four stars quality, all crash types, all severities with CMF of 0.85. Protected less, four stars, angle, all severities, and CMF of 0 0.01. Um, lighting is a three, I chose the three star quality, nighttime, all crash severities, and 0.881. Personally, I like more precision sometimes. Uh, so we start breaking that down into what type of crashes we're going we're going to look at, right? Um, you know, we have angle crashes and non-angle crashes, uh, day crashes and night crashes. And even though we were originally looking at rear end, since the back plates go after all crashes, we're going to take that reduction for all of them. So we start looking at um, with uh, so in if you look at that matrix of angle versus day back plates and protected lefts. Um, so that's a 0.85 and a 0 0.01. If you look at night crashes with angle and night, you have lighting back plates protected lefts. Um, daytime non angle is just back plates with what we're doing, and nighttime non angle is, is lighting plus back plates. Uh, so theoretically, we can start multiplying them. If we do, um, we actually we can see what kind of changes it makes. And what you start to see is that even though theoretically we're adding more crashes, right? We're 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 getting those reductions, so that we're not getting the additive of 0.881 and 0.85 for night and non angle. We're not adding up um, those two with the multiplication. It takes us down to 0.75. It ends up giving us um, a reduction of 23 crashes for daytime angle, nighttime crashes is 13, negative 13, day nine angle 17. So you see how we start applying it, right? We have here going back slide. We've taken our CMFs, we figured out where they fit. <clears throat> we've done the calculations to get what we're going to use. And then we apply that to these crashes, right? So we have here's the at the top. The top chart is the number of crashes that we're working with. It's made up. Um, we apply this. The CMS to it, and that's what we get. So I just what I did with some of those, like the 0.24 is essentially 24 crashes times 0 0.01 gives me 0.24 and I round it up to a singular crash. Um, and then just. 
doing the inverse to figure out what our reduction actually is. But you can see when we were doing that, we broke it out. We, we had to be careful about which ones we took and applied to which crashes because we can't, we can't apply it to all of them. Um, I'm going to skip questions real quick because we're almost at the end. Um, NCHRP 991 actually takes that and simplifies it. So you can still look at those CMFs on your own and say, hey, like all of these are, re I'm going to find like the three things that are super effective at preventing this type of crash. You can still do that. What NCHRP 991 is doing is it's recommending, and there's this language and there's specific language in the uh, appendix. It's recommending that there's no longer, you no longer combine CMFs. And what we do is we use the best CMF for a particular um, situation. So if we go back to <clears throat> these combinations, right? Uh, I think this slide is probably the best place of showing it. So in this case where you're doing nighttime angle crashes and you're getting a reduction in angle crashes from the back blades, right? Because because the uh, the back blades 0.85 and affected all crashes, you're getting a 0.85 um, adjustment on the angle crashes at night. You're getting a 0.881 because you put lighting in. You're getting a 0.01, um, so 99% reduction based on the projected phasing. In this case, there's no reason to look at the when you're doing your calculation the back plates and the lighting because you're getting such a good um, reduction from the left turns. And we want to be a little bit conservative because we don't want to overestimate what we're doing. And I think what some of the things we're finding is that in some of that predictive analysis, there are decisions being made because it's, it's a decision making tool. Based off of a non conservative CMF because a bunch of them were combined. Um, so it's going back in and saying like, hey, maybe we should back that off. And just find the best, like the single best one. You can use more, but let's find the single best one so we have a conservative decision making process. And that is what, get back, get back through them again. That is what the CMA, the, the NCHRP is trying to use, is using that best singular one for each situation. Um, I said earlier when you're going through this, the clearinghouse. Um, there is, if you click about clearinghouse, there are a lot of references that you can find on there for more information about how to use it. And then once you get to say using CMS, there's even more links inside the body of it to talk about application, um, getting a method to analyze um, and applying that, that uh, the analytical techniques. It, it's something to get into. Um, at a project level, if you're not doing predictive method, I would recommend just getting into the brochures and understanding a little bit more, um, getting comfortable clicking around in there and figuring out how to getting comfortable, like how do I select different ones for my decision making process? If you are going to get into the HSM predictive methods, um, I would recommend getting really into it, right? Like uh, understanding what you're going to do because that's going to affect your decision making process. And the decisions you make are going to have significant long term impacts. I'm just going to leave you with the warning. Um, essentially, just just always use caution. Um, and remember that our goal is to get to zero. So kind of like the question when the last ones about like rear end crashes, um, we are willing to trade less severe crashes in order to, to prevent the fatal serious injury. Ones. Um, that it, when we are doing our decision making process, there's a hierarchy of of goals and zero is our highest goal. So I know this is, a, this is probably a lot. If you haven't seen it before, um, there's probably a lot of new ideas. Uh, we didn't get it. We purposefully did not get that far into it um, because it's not the goal of this, but we do want you to understand it, um, be able to understand how to you think through a problem. Um, swear maybe we don't have a countermeasure that we can just apply right away. Like, but but why does that countermeasure matter? Or why does the design decisions that we make matter? Um, when we're selecting those countermeasures, understanding how effective they are using the clearinghouse um, and understanding that there is that resource available to you to use and that it, there is more to learn on it, 
if we do find ourselves in the position where we have to start doing uh, whether it benefits cost analysis or predictive methodologies. Uh, so that is our last slide. Um, and, you know, we have uh, about 20 minutes now that we can do Q&A, uh, more discussion. Um, it's up to you guys at this point. Any questions on what we covered? Uh, there is a question in the chat. Uh, are other factors relating to safety being considered or developed? Uh, example, dealing with extreme increasing heat as it relates to walkers, bikers, and transit users also impacts on infrastructure. I have seen that on the planning side. I haven't seen it on the engineering side. Um, on the planning side, that when we work with some of our cities, I've seen a lot of stuff, you know, talking about urban heat islands. Um, there's a lot of, you were talking about electric vehicles earlier and emissions. I've seen that regardless of emissions, um, tires, um, a heavy, basically the, uh, the pollution from tires wearing has a significant calculatable impact to the health of a community. Um, and probably Lois, you're very familiar too with as well, like, even just where we place our roads, like being a being a essentially a, like a canyon, uh, preventing people from getting from one side of their city to the other. So to answer your question, a lot of the things that are being calculated are engineering things that are being thought of in a very narrow mindset in the sense of it's being thought of from an engineering perspective of here's the data we have here is the effect that it has on the data on the transportation system i do not know that we are bringing in everything else although you are seeing some acknowledgement in some of those others when you start looking at context classification or some of the um like justice 40 initiatives and some of the other things like that katie and i would just say from our district perspective you know as much as safety is focus on engineering and process and procedures and trying to get to that target zero. Anytime there's like a task team working on something that's maybe not totally related, but maybe more planning level, et cetera, we usually provide a rep just so we can bring in that perspective. Um, but hey, in a perfect world, we get through all the engineering, we save every pedestrian and bicyclist from fatalities, from traffic crashes, and then we have other things we can be working on at the planning level. So, and, and when we talk about um, some of Lois's comments too. This is outside the scope of this meeting, but it's interesting because we have there is a lot of data out there on how to do these things well. The question is whether that data gets to, to implementation. Um, because when we talk about community health, the road, the community is not agnostic to the roadway. The roadway is not agnostic to the community. Um, so when we talk about urban heat islands, like you know, um, the more asphalt we add the, the higher the temperatures in an urban area, which has other, like direct health related outcomes. But then you can also see increased spikes in crime, right? Like the crime rate is affected by the heat in an area that is well proven. So you get stuff like that street trees, right? They help not only with placemaking, they also help with speed control. They also help with shading the area to reduce the heat, uh, the pollution, whether it's noise pollution, whether it's um, the tires wearing off, whether it's emissions helps with the, the surrounding area. Um, you know, e we've even seen uh, issues in uh, in populations from lead poisoning, right? From leaded gasoline causing significant brain damage in populations across the uh, the country. Um, we start looking at how our transportation system affects the health of communities and how much that like that walkability aspect is important, right? Because not only is it personal health, but it's getting out and about in your community and meeting people, whether it's so that social, that social mental health, that is crime reduction because you're engaged in your community, engaged people around it. So, you know, there's a tendency to look at it as like, this is this is my job. This is what I'm doing that's affecting. But the decisions that we make. There is a ton of research out there that shows how the decisions that we make have a lot of effect around the community. Um, it's just a question of whether that gets disseminated, whether it gets implemented, and whether it gets to be a part of our policy and what we're looking at. Carla? Uh, just to 
question kind of comment um would you have any ideas or like tricks tips on how to address things or justify safety improvements on things that may not be in the clearinghouse specifically my main um, thought was extending like the storage lengths for left turn lanes uh, extending storage is not something that is clearly laid out but would there be potential improvements or safety improvements that would come from that that is a very debatable subject, um, especially in urban areas. So <clears throat> I think, especially with D4, and I do not envy you on this, um, there's the answer to a lot of your safety problems is gonna be it depends. Like traditional traffic engineering view is we wanna make sure that all the vehicles are in the queue um, because we don't get, and we wanna clear the queue with the signal finding, right? We don't want, because otherwise we're gonna look at people staging in the main line, which is gonna cause issues. We're gonna look at aggressive driving, stuff like that. Uh, the challenges though, the consequences of doing things like that mean now your signal timing, you, your signal cycles are much, much longer um, because you are, you're trying to turn up, uh, clear the cues, um, to keep it from getting backing out the main line, which affects your, your um, your measures of effectiveness and as well as you know, driver behavior out there. Uh, but then does that cause pedestrians to decide, you know, the heck with the intersection, I'm going to cross anyway, and they're going to walk across that queue. Um, does it create an issue? Because now and you see this in access management, when you try to accommodate all the left turn queues, it starts reducing the amount of times that you can make median openings, which access is a balance between we want, it's not denying access, right? It's managing it. We we want to separate decision making and make it more structured, but we don't want to completely deny it. We want to facilitate the network of the local streets. Um, we don't want, and as we back that that turn lane up and say now we can't have that meeting opening, then those turning movements get into the queue and make the queue even lar larger. So, I think those are very specific things. I think when you start getting into some of those, you're going to have to start hunting for university research or hunting for NCHRPs. I think you're also have to start making better decision making um, based on the unique area because we do have that. That is one thing that I will say um, when I came into traffic engineering is there was a lot of old hats that were still there, um, and a lot of the the knowledge that we had was based off of very very old studies and old philosophies. Um, you know, like I always heard. So, like I'll give a good example. It's, it may not be exactly what you're talking about, but uh, signal warrants. When I, I was the, the, the district um, traffic services program engineer for a while, and at that time, District 1 only warranted off of 1A, 1B, and Warrant 7. We didn't consider any other warrants. We would not warrant off of anything else. Um, and that was done largely with the idea that traffic signals cause more corrupted crashes than they solve um which is technically true but uh we changed our policy down the road and that that was done off of um some people that were you know 40 plus years of experience because that's what had always been done and it was true but the, when we look at the difference between traditional engineering and say vision zero is the idea we're not worried about all the crashes we're worried about the really really bad ones and when you look at traffic signals from that life the traffic signals start to make a lot more sense and the old way of doing things does not because they do prevent a significant portion of the really really bad crashes even though the say rear ends may go up at that, that intersection so when you're dealing with the left turn lane cues it's kind of like the right turn lane question as well. Like there is that that knowledge or that idea of, hey, we need to get people out of traffic so that we don't cause crashes, but it's not. There's always an asterisk attached to it, and I think with the left turn lanes. It's a difficult one because the realities of traffic backing up into the main line are real. But there's also the point where it doesn't matter what you do, it's going to back up anyway. So how do you mitigate it from there? And 
my take on that is having a hierarchical having a hierarchy of what you're trying to accomplish um and not making that decision in a vacuum right so we may with the right turn lane using that as an example it may help but then if we prioritize hey we want to make sure we're prioritizing this the, like this type of safety or like the high level safety and this starts to not make sense again and then mitigating the crashes as well any other questions or sorry did that um carla was did that answer what you're looking for yeah i kind of expected that that it just kind of depends on on the area which is yeah it's expected for at least our our urban areas down here in district four <laughs> i mean i mean engineering right like it, it we wouldn't get there wouldn't be responsibility if we just applied standards like the standards isn't probably like our job like uh our jobs whether we're planners engineers technically like whatever is to solve problems and that's that really is what it is but you are in a also a more challenging location any other questions we got about nine minutes Lori, no questions this time I'm trying to find something in response to what Lois asked about different data metrics, and now I'm in some kind of interesting rabbit hole, um, sharing it in the chat. But and then I was trying to find about models and stuff and what else is used for one of the studies I found. I mean, it was it was from Montgomery County, Maryland, but they used the CMFs. So then that I don't know, but the most recent thing, I don't know if that's just about pavement design or the info pave. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know what that is offhand? It's about pavement, so maybe it's just pavement performance, but it does make me think about um, what is it for 18 wheelers? Some of them have very, very wide tires, right? And then some of them have. Like normal size tires, I was wondering about those with the force does that make any difference on the pavement when it comes to well i don't know i think i think it would depend on the sort of like the contact patch right in the surface area because i don't remember what the the old what i used to hear was that um one tractor trailer does the same amount of damage to the asphalt as ten thousand cars um so I think it would depend on the contact patch. I, I think those are less safe, personally, from a a um, redundancy standpoint. Like if you have a tire blowout with and you have dualies, you still have a tire. Um, whereas if you only have one tire and it blows out, then you're toast. Um, there's something else that's gonna bring up. Was it? Oh, measures. Um, so I can't, and I'm really glad those brought it up. I can't stress measures enough. Our decision making is largely largely driven on measures. So going back to that, that left turn lane conversation, um, if you look at a different way of signal timing, for instance, um, yeah, when you start getting Q spillback and you start getting the massive turns, if you're only looking at vehicle crash, if you're only looking at vehicle performance metrics, then it starts to make sense to extend your protected lefts out longer, right? Um, and and allocate more time. But what if you were also looking at like pedestrian delay, right? Because we tell pedestrians that you need to go to the intersections, you need to go to the designated crossing areas. But then when they get there, if if you're sitting in, you know. 90 plus degree weather and the sidewalks hot already and you're there for a couple minutes like you're really getting tired of waiting um and if we tell a vehicle like you know if i'm sitting in my truck and i've got the ac blasting a very comfortable seat and i'm listening to a podcast um that's not the same thing as me standing on the corner i'm going to make decision as a pedestrian to go a lot earlier right so who so when we start changing some of our metrics for example with signal timing our decision making and what we do with our turn lanes, with our um, signal timing, because really at that point, turn lane starts to become a function of our signal timing, starts to change a lot. Um, 
looking at vehicles not travel versus level of service, looking at safety versus throughput, like those those measures essentially state what our values are and our values state what our decisions are going to be. But the intersections where pedestrians can cross at like diagonals, are those, I don't know if there are any in Florida or any in this district. Um, do you find those being safer or it depends or? I don't. It, I think it depends again, right? Because it's. I don't know that it's a safety issue. The issue, the reason why I think you don't see them as much is. And there's some in Orlando, I believe. Um, I think what it ends up getting down to is you can't. When you're doing pedestrian crossings, you can still move cars. Um, if you're doing a traditional like four square. This, the diagonals. Um, cars can't go at all, really, except maybe some like right turning movements. So you have to shut down the intersection essentially. But on the flip side of it, if you have a pedestrian that's trying to go like to make the two stage crossing, it drastically would improve your pedestrian wait times in a positive direction. Uh, so I, it, it, that's one of those like, what what's your context and who are your users and what are you trying to solve? Yeah, we have one in D4, and at least the one, there's one uh, on A1A commercial boulevard. Like if you drive along the commercial towards the east at the end of it, um, so it's they call it exclusive pedestrian fate. And so that that provides a certain uh, like time interval for pedestrian crossing at the intersection at all the directions. So. Yeah, it, it it will affect the operation significantly. So it, it, it's good for the locations. I uh, have a lot of pedestrians like go to you know like a uh, crossing the A Y go to beach and also um on A Y people typically don't really care about how long they wait. So those are the good locations for the implementation of the um uh, exclusive pedestrian phase. Yeah. Probably have time for one more question. Who's going to be brave? All right, um, Katie, uh, let's see. We Thursday morning will be the next time we see you. Um, any last words before we go to lunch? You or Tracy? I think I'm good. As usual, great conversation. I think everybody's been super engaged. Chat's been blowing up with good input, so thank you all.